Challenge number four is to create a second level. So once the cat gets to that apple, how do we change the maze? How do we do something else? Well, it's an open-ended challenge, so for the students, we're just saying create a second level. They decide what that means. I'm going to show you, the teacher, what that means. That means I need to go back to the stage and draw a new maze. So just like we could have multiple costumes on the cat, we can have multiple backdrops on the stage. Just like we duplicated the cat's head to keep everything but the mouth the same, might be a good idea to shift click on backdrop one and duplicate it to keep that outer border. I use the erase tool to erase these lines in the middle. But I want to show you the advantage of using vector graphics for a maze. Watch. I'm going to convert to vector mode. Clicking the convert to vector mode button. I'm going to change my thickness again to about midway. Now I'm going to use the line tool in vector mode. Hold the shift key just like I did in bitmap mode to draw my lines. And at first I'm just going to draw a maze exactly the same as what I had. But watch what I can do in vector mode. I can use the select tool to click on any line and just move the whole thing around. But better than that, I can also quickly resize the line without distorting it as it would be in bitmap. If that's not cool enough, if I hold the shift down, I can select multiple objects like we did with the cat's body and move them around at once or resize them. But what I can't do once I've converted to vector mode, I won't be able to use the reshape tool like I did on the cat's mouth. And if I resize that outer one, it's not doing what I want. Because we started in bitmap mode. When you convert to vector mode, it doesn't actually convert the lines to vector lines. It makes them one flat layer in the back that you can put vector lines over. That's going to make more sense when we get into our next game. For now, just know you're only going to be able to edit the vector lines with vector tools if you've drawn them in vector mode. Can I show you my favorite trick in vector mode for creating more complicated mazes? I'm going to use the rectangle tool, make sure my line thickness is about midway, and I'm going to draw a series of rectangles, starting in the middle the small ones, then here, then here, then here. Now I'm in vector mode, so I don't have to worry so much about them being exactly the right size. I can resize them afterwards. So let's resize to make sure my head can has room. And look, I can send them back layers. So if I'm having trouble selecting another one, it might be because the first rectangle is above it. So I can use these back and forward layers. Each thing you draw in vector mode is on its own layer. So we can make that and here and using back a layer so I can try and select that smallest one. I can click all three and go back. Oops, went a little bit too far back behind that background white. Now what you might be thinking is, there's no way to navigate it, it's not a maze. Well, watch what I can do now. First I want to make sure my cat head can fit. So I'm clicking and dragging the cat head on the stage, and notice it's really not small enough to go through this newer maze, and I have some narrow areas that I'm going to need to tweak. But I really just want to show you how to draw the maze at this point, because this is the cool part. So 
Let me go back to my backdrop. For the doors, why don't I just select the rectangle tool again, solid, and make white rectangles. Solid white rectangles. See? I can put one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. And if you want to have pity on your player, you can have a couple options for navigating. Now you've got a more complicated maze, and if you wanted to create a new level and just move where those walls are, you could duplicate and just move the door. But right now it's more of a labyrinth. There's really no wrong way to go. So how about using the line tool Make sure I have my same shade of blue. In fact, if I'm not sure which swatch is that shade, I can use the eyedropper tool. Pick a color, click on the wall to choose the exact shade of blue. That's very important for my detect color block. Then I can grab my line tool, go to medium, and throw in some dead ends. And I'm holding the shift key to make sure it's a nice straight parallel line. And I could put the shift key, put a wall there, put a wall there, put a wall there. So they can make it as complicated as they want. But I'm going to need to change the size of my cat head. I'm going to go all the way down to 40%. Click the green flag, go full screen. Now, do you notice I'm still having trouble moving? Now, this is two reasons. One is those whiskers are causing a problem. As soon as the whisker hits a wall. Also, I'm moving 10 steps at a time, which means I'm not really getting close to the wall. So as I make my scratch head smaller and my maze more complex, it's probably a good idea to reduce the number of steps that the cat head is moving. So I can change it from 10 steps to, say, 4 steps. 4 steps. Make sure I change all 4. Click the green flag, go full screen. So 4 steps should allow me to navigate through my mains. Looks like I should still go a little bit smaller. And I might want to remove those whiskers. If you like the whiskers, I could suggest to students they ungroup, shift click on each of the whiskers on each side, and go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 with the right arrow key. Click, shift click. Arrow key, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Why did I count? So that I can go to the other costume, sh ungroup, shift click on the two whiskers, and move exactly the same amount. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And of course on the other side. I'll let you count this time so it's not too annoying. I'm having a little trouble selecting those. Now, see, I didn't move it quite enough. Or it looks like I moved it one extra on the left. So I can shift click, oops, shift click, and move out one. That's better. But I want it to be perfect. So I'll move out one more. There you go. So notice, very helpful to tweak, to nudge just a little bit using those arrow keys to make subtle changes. And important, any changes that are made to one costume are going to be, need to be made to all the costumes on that sprite. So now if I go full screen, green flag, it's a little bit easier to navigate because I've adjusted those whiskers. 
But how do we change to the next level? So from the simple level to the more complicated level. Right now, if I click the to the apple, I'll win, right? So we want to also set level one at the beginning. Maybe I should name these backdrops. Level one, backdrop two, level two. And for the apple, I don't want to say you win unless you're in the second level. But let's hold on to that code for a second. In fact, let's hold on to that entire script with forever. I don't want to allow the player to win in level one. So for level one, when green flag clicked, I want to set the position of the apple and set the backdrop to level one. So I can finally put some scripts on the backdrop. When green flag clicked, looks, switch backdrop to level one. So at the beginning of the game, if I click the green flag, we have level one. And for the apple, I want to set a position. Let's drag it into position. And under motion, use my go to x, y. So at the very beginning of the game, it will show and go there. But when I touch the apple, if I'm in level one, I want to go to level two. So let's duplicate these blocks. Shift click, duplicate and say, if touching player, don't say you win. I just want you to change to a different position. And I want to change the backdrop. But how can the apple communicate with the stage to tell it to change its backdrop? I can use something very powerful called broadcasts. If touching the player, I can broadcast a message. And the message could be change level. So if touching player, broadcast, change level. And then on the stage, when I receive a broadcast message change level, switch backdrop to level 2. See if it works. I test my code, drag my cat over here quickly. Boop. What happened to the cat's head and what happened to the apple? Well, we haven't told the apple where to move yet, so that'll be the next thing. And we also need the cat's head to go back to its original position. So here, let's go to the cat first. So we also need to tell the cat if it receives a broadcast. Let me zoom out a little bit to have a little more room. So we can use that same broadcast for the cat. When I receive change level, I want to change my position back to here. So motion, go to, boom. So if I click the green flag, Yay, we have a new level. And my scripts still work, so the cat doesn't go through the walls. Great. We need to change the position of the apple. So on the apple scripts. Now what about this? When do I change it? I can't change it here. This is going to run forever. What if I do this? I could say after you broadcast change level, stop this script. Then how do I run this script? Couldn't I use the same message? Well, it's not such a good idea to put a broadcast, sending a broadcast and receiving a broadcast on the same sprite. Watch what I can do instead. Very handy for changing levels. When backdrop switches to level 2, 
So once that backdrop switches, I can have new script run for the apple or the prize. So I want the apple to go to a new place. Boop. So I'll go to motion. When backdrop switches, I want to change the position. Let's put it right in the center. So zero, zero. Now I can use this code. Why not? I could use it because we only have two levels. If you have multiple levels, you can just use a combination of backdrop switches and broadcasts. For now, this should totally fit the bill for that challenge number four. Let's go full screen to test. But I want to be able to cheat. I want to be able to drag my cat part way. So watch what I'll do. On the cat, if I click the information, I can say can drag in player. That means in full screen mode, I'll still be able to drag my cat's head. So now I'm going to click the green flag to start the game. Drag the cat to here. Goes to level two. Let's drag the cat to here. Save some time. You win. And then it stops. So now it's a maze game with two levels and a couple prizes. Which brings us to challenge number five. I don't expect most students to get to challenge number five. Some won't even get past challenge one or two in the allotted time. That's okay. They're going to have more time to work on this game on day two or in a later class. The idea is that they're starting with three mini projects, this being the second one, and then they're going to revisit those mini projects to add more functionality. This gives them exposure to three different types of games and gradually gets them used to new features in Scratch. Of course, I have to show you challenge number five just in case you get stuck to make sure that you can try to catch up to your students. Challenge number five, add enemies. Enemies will provide the obstacles for this game to make it more challenging. So click green flag once to go back to level one. What kind of enemy could be added? I want to start with the simplest kind of enemy. So I'm going to choose a new sprite. And the first one I saw was bat two. So I'm going to click OK. Now there's a bat. It's up to the student. This is an open-ended challenge. Add enemies. What's an enemy? They can decide. They can decide how the enemy moves, what happens if the enemy catches the cat. And I love this challenge because the really advanced students can even start to get into a little bit of artificial intelligence. How can they detect where the player is and change their behavior? They can decide if they want the enemy to be able to go through walls or fly over walls. I chose the bat so that I don't have to worry about walls for this enemy. I can just do something fairly simple. What I'll do for this simple enemy is say when green flag clicked, I want the bat to simply fly up and down. It's just going to fly up and down across the stage. So I'll control it just like the ball in the previous game. I'll say move 10 steps forever. And I want it to be going up and down. So the initial direction, I'll have it be down since it's starting up here. Let's even give it a starting position. Go to its current position. It's going to go there, point down, move 10 steps. But if it points down now, the bat's going to rotate, remember? Watch, click the green flag, it rotates. I don't want it to be flying in that strange way. So of course I need to set my rotation style to be left and right. And when it gets to the bottom, what do we want it to do? Yep, just like before, bounce. Boop, boop, boop. Now it's moving pretty fast. I could put a weight in there, but it'll move a little smoother if I just change the number of steps it's moving. Let's say move two steps or four. This is an area where you and your students can adjust the difficulty level. We don't want it to be too easy or it won't be fun to play. We don't make it too hard because player gives up. What did I call that before? 
hard fun. But now, if the player moves, nothing's going to happen when it touches the bat because we haven't programmed anything. So instead of just having an enemy, we want the enemy to have some kind of behavior. So I could say, on the player sprite, control if, let's put it in this same block where we have another if, so that we're checking things at the same time. I don't want to put it down here with next costume because of that wait block that might prevent it from detecting. So if touching bat, let's just have it go back to its original position. So I could duplicate this, drag the forever back into the drawer to delete it. If touching bat to go back to your original position. So let's test. I move my cat head, move my cat head, and if it's touching the bat, it gets sent back to its original position. Great. If you want to make it more complicated, you could use something on the bat like this. Look in motion. There's a really great block for enemies. Point towards. Watch what this does. We could say point towards the player. Now, when I click the green flag, oh, it's actually going right after me. The problem is the bat's going faster than my player, so there's no chance for the player to get away. So maybe we'll say move one step instead of four. Click the green flag. Now, as I move my cat, the bat tries to reach the cat. make it a bit more fun by making the bat's wings flap. I happen to know there are two costumes there. So I could use the same blocks that I used here. That's it. That alarm tells me I'm out of time for this video. So think about different ways that you can make the enemies more interesting and I'll be back soon for minigame number three. Thank you.